Luke 1, 5 through 17. So we have said in this church, we have this little diagram that we use when we're talking about the gospel. Many of you have seen this before. The gospel can be seen through 10 events. That Jesus, number one, preexisted eternally as God. Number two, there was a day when the Father sent the Son into the earth Number three, Jesus, the son, he entered into his own creation through the womb of a virgin named Mary, right? Um, That's Christmas. And then he lived a perfect life for 33 and a half years, approximately. And then number four, he died on a cross for crimes he didn't commit. He died uh, as a substitute for sinners. Number five, he was buried. Number six, he rose again on the third day, just like he said he would. He called his shot, folks, and he hit it. Uh, he, uh, He rose victorious over the dark powers. And then number seven, he uh, was seen by many witnesses, over 500 at one time, 1 Corinthians 15 says. Then number eight, he ascended and he sat down at the right hand of the Father where he is right now today, seated at the right hand of the Father in power, ruling the nations. About 10 days after he sat, he sent. He sent forth his spirit, number nine, on the day of Pentecost. You can read about that in Acts chapter number two. He sent forth his spirit to be his agent in the world, in his church, uh, to, uh, to bring the kingdom and to spread the kingdom and to continue the ministry of Jesus in the earth. That's number nine. And then number 10, one day he will return as judge and king and bridegroom and savior and friend and all sorts of other um, wonderful roles that he'll fill. And, um, and he'll bring a new creation, new heaven and new earth forever. This is the gospel. Now, there are four books in your Bible called the Gospels. They're called the Gospels because they tell the really relevant parts of this gospel story. So, for instance, the Gospel of Luke tells 3 through 7. That's what the Gospel of Luke tells. It focuses on 3 through 7. And then number 8 and number 9 are found in Luke's follow-up volume called the Book of Acts. Right? Um, but three through, three through seven is the gospel of Luke. And today, I want to focus in on specifically what Luke had to say about the birth of Christ. All right? uh, John will start with actually number one. He'll start with Jesus existing pre, uh, pre-existing eternally with God in the, in the gospel of John. But Luke doesn't start with number one. He starts with number three. And so when you turn to Luke chapter number one, you expect to hear this story, right? Right, Chloe? This is what you would expect to hear. If we're telling about the birth of Christ, well, you would just look right down here, and, or, or you just you know, look at any manger scene you've ever seen, and you would expect to, to be told about the backstory of Joseph and Mary. But Luke doesn't start this way. He doesn't start with the backstory of Joseph and Mary. He starts with the story of a different couple. He starts with a slightly more seasoned couple, an older couple. Not Joseph and Mary, but Zechariah, and Elizabeth. Elizabeth was either Mary's cousin or Mary's aunt, aunt, um, but uh, a relation to Mary. And this is the story that Luke starts with. And so this is where we'll take our text today. So let's learn about this couple, Elizabeth and Zechariah. The Bible says, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, He had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now, while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, He was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. This is a huge privilege. Some priests would go their entire life, never one time getting this privilege to go in. Because there's thousands of priests. And so the odds of you being able to go in and burn the incense one, one morning was very low. So Zechariah hit the lottery. He was chosen by lot. What a day. 
to enter the temple of the Lord and burn the incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. So he had a lot of people waiting outside for him. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord. Not only did he hit the lottery, but also now an angel is appearing to him. What a day! Standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. Remember, she was barren and, and advanced in years. You shall call his name John. Of course, this would grow up to, he would grow up to be what we would refer to as John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus. And you will have joy and gladness, the angel said, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or beer, strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. What a baby. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. He's quoting now a prophet named Malachi, Malachi chapter 4. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people that is prepared. All right, that's the first kind of half of introducing uh, us to this family. And uh, we'll talk about the other half of it another week. But we're just going to stop there right now and draw some truth from these passages. He did. Come on. (laughs) What a day. All right. So Luke starts it by saying, in the days of Herod, king of Judea. In the days of Herod. This is to introduce us to the political climate of the day. Now, this may mean absolutely nothing to you. But if I were to say in, in, the, in the 20th century, if we were to say in the days of Hitler, you would, oh, a chill would run up your spine, right? <laughs> Hitler, right? So that kind of a word, Hitler, that name evokes emotion in us. And, and so did Herod in their days. Bad guy, all right? Bad guy. I'm going to read from you from um, uh, Michael Card in his commentary on Luke. He said this. Whenever a historical figure, especially someone like Herod, is mentioned, the writer intends that an emotion will come along with it. When we read that it was in the days of King Herod, a chill should run down our spines. Quite simply, Herod was a monster. He came to power amid a bloodbath with the help of two Roman legions in 37 BC. Uh, so take January 5th riots and you know, multiply by 100x. Okay, This kind of an overthrow sort of a thing. He murdered both of his brothers-in-law, he murdered his wife, and he murdered his mother-in-law to be able to come into power. Just before his own death, just to make his death a little bit more dramatic, just before his own death, he ordered that prominent citizens in Israel would be gathered together into the Hippodrome. The decree was that upon his death, they would be executed so that there would be widespread mourning in Israel. Yeah. I just want everybody to remember this as a sad day, the day I died. So let's kill a bunch of famous people along with my, the day of my death. Bad guy. It was in these days that our story begins. Right? This sets the political climate uh, in which Zechariah and Elizabeth are ministering. A priest named Zechariah. Well, what was the spiritual climate like? He's a priest, right? He's like a, he's like a pastor. Uh, we could say today, maybe the most prominent uh, religious leadership figure in America today is a pastor, and in that day it was a priest. Uh, so what was, the, um, what, was, what was the religious climate like? Well, think about what you know about the Pharisees and Sadducees. Matthew, is it very good? When you think of Pharisees and Sadducees, do you have you know, a picture of a bunch of really righteous, wonderful men of God who loved the Lord of God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength and had the purest of motives? No, they tried to kill anybody that would come across them, right? Anybody that would, um, was a threat to their power, they literally tried to kill them or did kill them. Bad guys. Politics, not in a very good situation. And spiritual climate, not in a very good situation in Zechariah's day. He was named Zechariah. Now, names in the olden days um, were not like, hey, let's get a name book and let's try to find one that none of our friends have. Let's just do something unique, right? It's kind of what some of us do when we, name, when we named our kids. Um, 
they were, not, they were not like that in the Old Testament days. When you named a child, especially a Jewish man, when a Jewish man named his son, he would, he would pray long and hard about what to name him. I know some of you have done this with your own children as well. Um, and, and that's exactly what Zechariah's father would have done. Um, Zechariah was the name of an Old Testament prophet. There's a prophet Zechariah in the Old Testament. That's not the same guy. But also, Zechariah has a meaning of its own. And the name Zechariah means remembered by the Lord. Remembered. Zakar is to remember. And so there's this connection throughout Zechariah's life and his testimony here in Luke 1 about the one who the Lord remembers. He remembers the Lord, and the Lord remembers him. Um, this, becomes, this is actually a theme throughout the entire Old Testament um, where we see this uh, um, people are re- remembering God. In fact, it's one of the things that the priests did if you're reading 1 Chronicles chapter number 16, when David, King David, the mightiest king in Israel, when he established 24-7 uh, worship to go on around uh, the Ark of the Covenant, 24-7 priests would be there worshiping and praising the Lord. One of the things he told them to do was just remember in the Lord's presence. This is actually a wonderful way for you to commune to the Lord. It would be, it would be a wonderful time of communion for tomorrow morning for you to sit down and just say, okay, Lord, just me and you. Let's remember together. And take an hour just to remember the good things the Lord has given you, the ways that you've seen him come through, and write them down and praise him for every single one. That is a form of prayer and worship, to remember in his presence. So we remember God, and then God remembers us. God remembers us. Um, I think about um, Exodus chapter number 2, when all the children of Israel were were under the, uh, the whip of Pharaoh, and it says that, God re- heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so he moves in. Why does he move in? Because he remembered them. He remembered the promise that he has made over these people. Or how about Rachel? Rachel in the book of Genesis, who's barren. She's not able to have a child, like Elizabeth today uh, in this story. But R- Rachel's not able to have a child. God remembered Rachel and listened to her and opened her womb. So Zechariah that even the name Zechariah reminds us of this dynamic we have with the Lord where we remember him and he remembers us. Now, what's the last book in your Bible? Somebody call it out. What's the last book of the Bible? Revelation, Revelation. good. What was the last book in Zechariah's Bible? Malachi. Malachi, very good. Yeah, he only had the first three quarters of this. So Zechariah, this priest that we're talking about today, when he carried around his Bible, the last book of his Bible was the book of Malachi. All right. Now, the last chapter of Malachi is Malachi chapter 4. This is the last chapter in his Bible. The last page in his Bible would have been the end of Malachi chapter number 4. This would have been a significant passage to him. Malachi chapter 4, the last book, the last chapter, the last page, and the last command on that page, the very last command on that page was this. Remember. Zakar, same as his name. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him. So echoing from Zechariah's Bible, in the very last word that a prophet had spoken that was written down in scriptures, the very last command that Zechariah had as a priest, the very last command he had from the Lord was remember the law of my servant Moses and all the statutes and all the rules that I commanded him. And Zechariah was faithful to that command. That's why our story tells us that they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. They took to heart the last commandment that was in his Bible, in Malachi chapter number four. He remembered the Lord. The command is remember all the commandments. He remembered the Lord. And Luke 1 is telling us, and the Lord remembers him. It's this relational dynamic of remembering just found in the very meaning of his name. Now, this is a passage that you could just roll right by, but we're going to stop here. All the commandments and statutes of the Lord. How many is that? For a man to be faithful to all the commandments and statutes in the first five books of the Bible, that's 613 commandments, and he was faithful to all of them. uh, That doesn't happen by accident, Ellie. For you to be faithful to 613 commands blamelessly, 
perfectly means that you have chosen to center your life around these. And every, you never take a day off. There's never a day like, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to take, take a day off and not observe any of the commands. Live like the other people, right? Take off this kind of, uh, this burden, if you will. No, he has chosen every day to keep God first in his life and to follow these commands. What would, what would his life be like? Well, for someone to, to live like this, they would be performing sacrificial duties every single day. The primary responsibility was to perform various sacrifices, including burnt offerings, grain offerings, sin offerings, peace offerings, lots of offerings to the Lord, which involved lots of slaughtering of animals and presenting their blood on the altar. That's number one on his list. Number two, temple maintenance. Uh, priests were responsible for keeping the temple clean, including removing the ashes from under the altar and maintaining all the sacred utensils, keeping all the utensils sharp. Well, you got to keep the knife sharp, right? Uh, then rituals and ceremonies. They would perform rituals for people who were deemed unclean, and um, they, would have to, uh, they would have to test whether or not they truly were and uh, give them um, a thumbs up on purification. And then teaching and instruction. They had to know the Bible inside and out, so that, they, that way they could instruct people who didn't know how to read the Bible. People back then didn't have a Bible, and they, if they did have a Bible, they didn't know how to, most of them didn't know how to read. And so the priests had to know the Bible so well so that day in and day out they could teach people the ways of the Lord. So he had to commit his life to learning the Bible and then strict purity laws that he himself and Elizabeth had to live by. Uh, day in and day out, these laws that they had to abide by so that they could stay pure themselves to be uh, priests of the Lord. This is a committed couple committed couple. Now, in doing this, in saying this right here, Luke is actually defending their character. He wants us to know that they've done nothing wrong. Now, why, does he, why do we need to defend their character? Well, because she was barren. Because Elizabeth was barren. Now, you might say, well, what's the big deal with that? Well, barrenness in, the old, in those days produced personal shame and community stigma. If a woman was barren, there must be something wrong, right? Because that just doesn't happen to women, especially not, God, not God's people, right? Uh, so why was Elizabeth barren? Well, Luke wants us to know she, it's not because she had done anything wrong. This was not a curse that was upon her from the Lord. She's done nothing wrong. She is blameless, but she was barren. When, when her barrenness was taken away, when she gave birth to John, she said, my reproach among the people will be taken away. The community stigma that I've lived with for oh, maybe 60 years will finally be taken away. So why? Why, why, was, why was there this stigma? Well, number one, there's this general notion, a general notion that bad things, hap or, uh, bad things happen to bad people. Right? Isn't, that how, isn't that how life works, Chad? Bad things happen to bad people. So if something bad has happened to you, that means you must be, that's right, bad, right? Because bad things happen to bad people. This is actually a lie that the friends of Job believed as well. When they went and found Job, they said, oh, Job, look at you, you sorry, um, yeah, you sorry guy. Uh, <laughs> uh, you must have done something very awful. So let's all pray about what awful thing you've done to deserve this, right? Bad things happen to bad people, of course. That's the general notion. It's a general notion. It was, it was not only a general notion amongst God's people. It was a general notion amongst the pagans as well. We just read in our daily Bible this week that uh, Paul was on the island of, uh, of Malta and a viper bit his arm and he shook it off. And all the pagans, all the pagans on the island said, oh, a viper has bit him. That means he must be horrible. He must be a bad man, right? He must be some sort of a robber. Maybe we need to put him to death. And it's like something bad happened. That guy must be bad. That was something even pagans believed falsely. Something the disciples believed as well. Remember John chapter number nine, they meet a blind man. They say, Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he is born blind? Bad things happen to bad people after all, right? That's a general notion. It's a general lie that people believe. The second one was that there is this national promise that faithfulness will be rewarded with fertility. Faithfulness will be rewarded with fertility. This is a promise that's found in her own Bible. The faithfulness is rewarded with fertility. So if you're not fertile, that means you must be unfaithful. 
This is at least the line of thinking. Here's the, here's the promise. Listen to it. If you fully obey the Lord your God, which is exactly what we just read about her. She fully obeyed the Lord. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep all his commands, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the world and you will experience all these blessings if you obey the Lord. The Lord will give you prosperity in the land, blessing you with many children, numerous livestock, and abundant crops. If you faithfully obey the Lord, you're going to be blessed with many children. Elizabeth is barren, so what does that tell us about her walk with God? This is the trap that they're stuck in. But if this is the promise, then why is Elizabeth barren? Why is Elizabeth barren? Now, some Christians would immediately go to, God made her barren for this great purpose. I would not go to that deduction. Because the Bible does not tell us that God made her barren. I will only say that God inflicted something like barrenness or cancer or anything else. I will only say that if God explicitly reveals that he is the one who does it. Because he typically doesn't do that. He is not the God of all maladies. He's the God of all healing. He's not the God of all sicknesses. He's the God of blessings, right? Uh, so I would not go to God made her barren. I would stop and I'd say, no, I don't think it'd be wise to say that. Why then is she barren? Because Elizabeth lives in a fallen world. That's our answer. She lives in a fallen world, right? None of us get out, are going to get out of this world alive. <laughs> We're all going to die probably of some sickness, right? Uh, the odds are some of us could just die naturally of old age with perfect health, but the odds are low, okay? Uh, the odds are not in your favor. You will probably die of some sickness because none of us make it out of this world alive. Elizabeth is barren because she lives in a fallen world, would be our first option. Number two, she has a mortal foe, an enemy named Satan. And what we learn all throughout the Gospels is that Satan does work hard to make people sick, to give people maladies, because Satan knows how effective those maladies are in turning our hearts away from the Lord. Because we say, he must not care for me. It's that spirit of Cain. The Lord has rejected your offering. Look at you, you've worked so hard for the Lord. And look at now what the Lord has, look at what it's gotten you. You're sick. You have this stigma. You have this personal shame. He doesn't care for you. You shouldn't care for him. It's that same spirit that came to Cain to turn his heart away from the Lord. Satan works hard to bring sickness into the world and into our lives because he knows how effective it is to turn us away from the Lord, to get us to whisper, to listen to his whispers. But Elizabeth did not fall for this. She understood that the general notion that bad things happen to bad people, but she knows herself, I'm not a bad person. That's not why I'm barren. She knows that there's this national promise that is fulfilled throughout all of Israel. However, she, in, with, in, in mystery, still is barren, even though she's followed this command. Elizabeth didn't know or understand the why. Oh, here, I wrote this one down. Elizabeth didn't know or understand the why of her barrenness, so she spent her life focusing on the what and the who. Most likely, you're not going to understand the whys in your life either. There is mystery. A lot of the whys we get answers to. But why did this happen to me? Sometimes we get those answers, but for most of them, you don't get the answer. And so what do you do? You can stay trapped in the why game, the why circle, why, 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 and you'll probably just stand still. You'll just be turning around in circles your whole life, asking why, and you'll never make any ground for the Lord, right? You can spend your life doing this, or you can do what Elizabeth did. Stop asking the why. Focus on the what and the who. I don't know why I'm barren, but I know what I'm supposed to do now. I'm supposed to pray. I'm supposed to believe in God. I'm supposed to persist. And I'm supposed to serve my community. And I'm supposed to live blamelessly. And I'm supposed to be a righteous witness in the earth of what the Lord has done. Right? And that's what she's doing. I don't know why. But I know what and I know who. After all, comfort's not found in an answer. It's found in a person. And so the comfort she needed was not found in the answer to her why, but the comfort she needed was found in the Father, who she could go to every single morning and feel his loving embrace, and all the shame just falls off of her. And she's, she gets this thick skin uh, from all the community stigma, because I know who affirmed me this morning, 
And so even if you are still stuck in the notion that bad things happen to bad people, that's okay. I feel sorry for you. I'll pray for you. But I know what the Father has said about me, right? I don't know why. But I know what and I know who. And I'll commit my life to that. Elizabeth and Zechariah were faithful to minister to the Lord and to serve their community in season and out of season. It's right there where they encountered, where they had this encounter with God. So, a little conclusion for today, and then I'm going to have, uh, I've asked somebody to, uh, uh, Ms. Carol Hocutt, to um, uh, come up and give us a word of exhortation. And uh, that'll be right after our summary here. So, Zechariah. Luke begins the Christmas story, Chloe, quite unconventionally, not with Mary and Joseph, but with Zechariah and Elizabeth. And here's what we learn about these two. This is the beginning of the Christmas story. In the face of gross political corruption, clergy abuse, and personal disappointment, Zechariah practiced faithful faith, patient endurance, and loyal love. He was righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. And we were introduced to Elizabeth, that in the face of lifelong health issues, personal shame, and community stigma, Elizabeth exhibited faithful faith, patient endurance, and loyal love. She was righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. All right, lastly, what will be said of you? What will be said of you? You have your own list. You have your own list. I mean, it might not be barrenness for you. It might be something else. In the face of X, Y, Z. In the face of divorce. In the face, in the face of um, a father who abandoned me. In the face of lifelong struggle with this. In the face of this health issue. In the face of this blot on your record. In the face of this trial. You exhibited faithful faith, patient endurance, and loyal love. May it be said of you that you are righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and teachings of Jesus. I don't know how you do this outside of community. In fact, I think it might be almost impossible to do outside of community. And so I encourage each of you, come into this community or find another faith community where you can do life with, and together, may it be said of all of us, that we were righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the teachings of Jesus. 